All right, great. So today it's a pleasure to introduce Logan Crew, who is speaking about chromatic symmetric function, uh, the chromatic symmetric function with a K. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And yes, indeed, we are going to be talking about the chromatic symmetric function, both the usual one, but also the subject of our work, which is a k-theoretic analog. And this is joint work with Oliver Pachenik and Sophie Spurkel, also both at the University of Waterloo. And uh, let's get started. So we're going to be working with graphs. So just to be on the same page, everyone, a graph has a set of vertices V and a set of edges E that are pairs of vertices. Edges would be represented by going between two vertices. So here is an edge between Minneapolis and San Antonio in this map of a select number of US cities that have flights between them on Delta Airlines. And so this is the graph Delta. And this is just one example of a graph. It'll be the one we're using throughout this talk. So we're going to be working with graph colorings. An in coloring of a graph is an assignment to each vertex of a positive integer, one up through in. It's going to be a proper coloring if for every edge in the graph, the endpoints get different colors. So over here on the left, I'm using actual colors to represent the integers. This is a proper three coloring because every edge connects two vertices that have received a different color. Over here on the right, this is an improper three coloring because these two vertices have received the same color and they are connected by an edge. And people in general care a lot about proper colorings and counting them. So first there was the chromatic polynomial, which was introduced by Birkhoff and has been the subject of a lot of study throughout the 1900s. We're going to start here with the original chromatic symmetric function, which was a generalization proposed by Richard Stanley. So for the chromatic symmetric function, we care not only about the number of colors used, but we care about which ones in a certain sense. So this is a function in a countable number of variables. So a power series of sorts. And we sum over all proper colorings and to each one we give a monomial. For each vertex, this monomial has an X indexed by the color it receives. So in particular, the number, the exponent of x sub i is the number of vertices that receive color i. So in particular, this monomial is counting not just how many colors are used, but also how many times each color is used. And that is the distinction here. And so first of all, this function is a power series in with coefficients in in this particular case, it's going to end up being in, being in natural numbers, but generally it's over something. It's a symmetric function because for every permutation of the positive integers, it fixes the function. And this is because if we take a proper coloring of our graph and permute it, it's still going to be a proper coloring. And properly, we note that uh, if you were to specialize by setting the first in of the variables equal to one, you're going to recover chi g of n, because in this sum up here, this product is going to be a 1, if and only if all of the x sub i have index less than or equal to n, then, meaning that it is a coloring with colors from the set 1 up through n. And it's 0 otherwise. And also, if anyone has any questions during the talk, you're welcome to just say them uh, in the chat or otherwise. I don't know how that works. Hmm. So in terms of computing the chromatic symmetric function, we're going to look at the specific case of the graph delta. So over here is a proper three coloring, and we have three instances where the color one has been used, represented by blue, and one time each that the colors two and three have been used. So we get a monomial, x1 cubed, x2, x3. This is a different three coloring that uses one twice, and uses two twice, and uses three once. And for that case, we get an x1 squared, x2 squared, x3. 
So these are two different three colorings, which would be counted the same by the chromatic polynomial, but of different monomials assigned to them by the chromatic symmetric function. And the chromatic symmetric function itself is formally the sum of all of these things. So a better way to talk about computing XG to, because right now it's in an infinite form and we want to put it in a finite form. So we're going to introduce a method of, of taking care of these symmetric functions with finite terms. So in particular, what's happening here is that the x1 squared in a given monomial represents two vertices that get the same color, meaning that there's not an edge between them. More generally, xi to the n is in vertices, all of which must be pairwise non-adjacent in a proper coloring. So to kind of count this more easily, let's let pi denote any arbitrary partition of the vertex set of G into stable sets. And then we're going to let lambda of pi be the multi-set of integers arising from this by just counting the size of each block of pi. We call this an integer partition, and these are what are going to index our symmetric function basis elements. So here's a particular symmetric function. If you fix a given integer partition, so in this case, let's say we are looking at the partition that is two twos and one one, usually written by writing the parts in decreasing order left to right. So this is an M221, and that's going to be a specific sum of monomials. In this case, the sum of every monomial exactly once who that has three distinct variables, two of which get exponent two and one of which gets exponent one. So M221 has an x1 squared, x2 squared, x3. It also has all of the permutations of this, like x1 squared, x2, x3 squared. It also has every other monomial you can make with exponents two twos and one one for across three distinct variables. This will be a symmetric function. It's essentially one of the smallest ones we can get by symmetrizing a given monomial. Now, if we look at this graph, this is kind of where this is coming in, is that this particular monomial here comes from a stable set of size three and this two stable sets of size one. So what we're kind of hoping to say here is something along the lines of that the chromatic symmetric function in general can be written as a sum over all stable set partitions of the vertex set and the stable sets of this m lambda. Except this isn't quite right because we need to account for the fact that we get the same monomial if we switch these two guys. And to get this graph over here, this is using the same stable set partition, but as a different coloring that is also contributing the same monomial. And this is because we have two parts of size one. In general, if we had five parts of size one, then that's going to contribute five different xi's. And those five vertices could have those colors permuted, and it's going to still give us the same monomial. So we do some overall stable sets, but we have to also multiply by this factor. For each i, the number of i in lambda in the uh, lambda of pi factorial. Replacing m lambda with this overall function, this is a this is an expansion of the chromatic symmetric function into these m's. So, for example, here there is one way to split the graph into five stable sets, each of size one, the trivial one. We can count that there are four non-edges of this graph, so we get four m two one one one, and there is an m two two one. We showed that earlier, I think, and one m three one one, and those are all of the different ways you can partition the graph into stable sets. So this is the complete expansion of x delta in this basis. I haven't explicitly said yet this is a basis. It is a basis for the space of symmetric functions. Now, one thing that uh, Sophie Spurkel and I did a few years ago was look at this on vertex-weighted graphs. This is something that's been considered in a similar form by other people before, Noble and Welsh and the W polynomial, and uh, other people in the context of Vasiliev not invariance. And 
what we want to do is we want to give an integer weight to each vertex. And what we do is that for each vertex, we take X sub its color and raise it to the weight. So now in this context, the exponent of Xi is the total weight of all vertices receiving color I. There's a couple of reasons why this is a nice thing to do. The reason that we did it was to make it so that there's a very direct and simple usage of the deletion contraction relation for the chromatic polynomial in the sense that we get that the chromatic symmetric function of a vertex weighted graph is equal to that of graph with the edge deleted minus that of the graph with the edge contracted, where we also need to contract the weights. So when we take two vertices of weight M and weight N and we contract, we need the new vertex to have weight M plus N. And so as an illustration here, this is a proper coloring and it's also a proper coloring of the graph XG. So this is so this is rewriting the formula in this form. And this is G delete E. And a coloring of this where these get different colors is also a coloring when you add the edge back in and has the same monomial. On the other hand, if these vertices get the same color, then it's instead going to be a coloring over here where I give that color to the contracted vertex and I still have the right term because this green to the fifth is maintained across contraction. And to say a bit more about the algebra of symmetric functions that we're going to be using, those M lambda form a basis. Some other bases that we're going to use, the elementary symmetric functions, which are defined by E sub n is for in the partition that only has the integer n is just the sum over all monomials within distinct variables. And it multiplies across parts. So if you have an integer partition with multiple integers, you just take E of each one separately. So E32, for example, is going to be this product. And the power sum symmetric functions are defined in the similar way, except that we take P in to be the sum of every variable to the nth power, and then we multiply across parts. So P32 is this. And one other thing that's nice about vertex weighted graphs is that uh, we can represent individual symmetric functions by a graph. And the M basis is represented by a complete graph with the corresponding with its parts as corresponding vertex weights. And the power sum basis is the chromatic symmetric function of this graph where it has the vertex weights, but there are no edges. And the E basis can be represented as a disjoint union of cliques. So E321 up to a constant is going to be the clique of size three, a clique of size two, and a clique of size one. Yes, that should be up to a constant. And another symmetric function basis that we're going to be talking about, but that doesn't admit a simple graph interpretation, is the Schur basis. The Schur functions are defined, among other ways, in terms of filling boxes of a diagram with positive integers, and that is the approach I'm going to discuss here. So a Schur function for, for a integer partition lambda is formed by first taking a Young diagram of shape lambda, which is going to consist of length of lambda here is the number of distinct parts of lambda, number of numbers used. And it's going to have that many rows that are justified to the top and left here. And the ith row from the top contains lambda i boxes. So this is the diagram of shape two, two, and one. <clears throat> A semi-standard Young tableau of shape lambda is going to be a filling of this diagram so that you put in each box one positive integer so that the rows are weakly increasing from left to right and the columns are strictly decreased, strictly increasing from top to bottom, which should be changed. So this is a semi-standard Young tableau of shape two, two, one. We have one is less than or equal to one, two is less than three. And we have one, two, three going down and one, three going down. <laughs> then the sure function of type lambda is given by summing over all of these fillings and we multiply across all i, xi to the number of times i occurs in t. So in the sure function of type two, two, one, we have from this tableau an x1 squared, x2, and x3 squared. <laughs> 
why didn't care about sure functions, especially given that their their definition is a bit out there and they don't have a simple graphical interpretation. Sure functions are some of the nicest symmetric functions in a couple of relevant ways. For one, we have a connection to representation theory. One can map the sure function of type lambda to the irreducible symmetric group character of type lambda. And this ends up being a graded ring isomorphism and actually an isometry with respect to the right inner products of the space of symmetric functions with the space of class functions over permutation groups. On the other hand, there's a natural connection with topology. S lambda also represents in a natural sense the cohomology class of the Schubert variety indexed by lambda. So there's at least two different senses, depending on what you might know or what you might care about, in which sure functions are very fundamental. And so we're going to get into the k-chromatic symmetric function soon. We're going to do one more topic before the break, I think, which is we're going to motivate, first of all, why we ended up defining the function the way we did. So we're going to talk about Grothendieck functions, a k-theoretic function that for, that for our purposes, we're going to think of as being a lift of the sure functions in a natural sense, whereas the sure functions represent cohomology classes of Schubert varieties Grothendieck functions are representing the uh, structure sheaf of those same varieties. So how does the symmetric Grothendieck function work? For our purposes, we're looking at it in terms of multi-valued Young tableau. So we're looking at the same Young tableau that we did for sure functions, but instead of filling each box with a single positive integer, we fill it with as many positive integers as we want, subject to the constraint that we still want them to be semi-standard Young tableau when we pick one from each for each box. Equivalently, the maximum number here should be less than or equal to the minimum number here, and every number here should be less than every number here. So this is a valid multi-value tableau of shape 2, 2, 1, since 2 is less than or equal to 2, 4 is less than or equal to 5, and going down here we get 1, 2, 4, 7, and going down here we get 2, and then 5, 8. Then we define these stable Grothendieck functions and represent them by an S lambda with a bar over it to indicate this relationship as a sum over these multi-valued tableaus of this product, with the added constraint that we usually will give it a sign of minus one to the total number of numbers used, minus the number of boxes used. So in this case, it would be there's two more numbers than there are boxes, so this sign would be positive for this particular function. And I think this is a good place to take a five-minute break. Very good. Thanks very much. Um, any quick questions for Logan before, before we take our five-minute break?